I was put in mind of this particular question quite specifically recently. I was talking, I had one of those Skype conversations with a couple of producers, and one was saying, I don't want any of this art house nonsense sort of stuff. And I rephrased the word nonsense from their original choice of word. And the other one was saying, well, I don't know, maybe we ought to let Robin you know, get on with it and see what he wants. And I, I, They won't forgive me for parodying them in, in that sense. But you see, the one was, was concerned really for the return. They, they, they wanted every creative decision, in the end, my analysis is of, is of it, that every creative decision is subjected to the principle of audience accessibility. And that's governed in all sorts of ways. That's governed by marketing consultants and focus groups and forum research. And when you think about it, you're sitting there perhaps struggling with a creative truth. And the only discriminative factor that you have at your disposal is to ask yourself, what does the audience want? And the only mechanism you have to arrive at that is what people tell you the audience wants. And the other, on the other uh, end of, of the spectrum, you have work that, in the end, at is extreme, and these do ex extremitize very quickly. A heap of narcissistic nonsense, quite frankly. I was given an account from a friend who'd been a, a, a panelist on one of the film festivals, a lovely film festival in, in, in Europe, in Germany. And they, they saw everything as they had to as jurists. And they, they tolerated a huge amount of, of material of, of people, sort of 90 minutes of somebody gently flickering their eyebrow, looking meaningfully into space, that sort of thing. One of the jurists was not so polite and, and would shout out from time to time, I want to cut my throat! <laughs> so there you have it. You have these two extremes. And, and one says, if you write just for yourself, if you just follow your own instincts, your own proclivities, you arrive at something that may not be intelligible to anybody else. And on the other, you have work that arrives at something sometimes to the chagrin and, I would say, bewilderment of those who try to please everybody that pleases nobody. How do you resolve this? Well, as I said, you know, this is a question that haunts me and it haunts the work that I do. And, and they're different, different theories, different approaches that you could undertake. One is to find some sort of equidistance, some sort of magic pivot point between the two, where they're both held in a sort of equilibrium. But actually, you know, we, we need our artistic experiments, and we need our artistic heroic failures, and frankly, we sometimes need to sit down with a carton of popcorn and a bottle of something fizzy and watch the robots attack each other with lasers and that sort of thing. So we, we need our spectrum. Um, as an artist, as one, stick to one's own guns and the hell with them as long as one other person agrees with me that I'm a genius, you know, that's my life fulfilled. <laughs> or do we take the money and run? How, how do we, how, how do we resolve this? And I, I teach, I teach universities, I see young people and they're embarking, they're embarking on the creative arts as a way of life, that's their ambition. And I can see them already beginning to, to fight with this conundrum. Um, we could unpack the question in a couple of ways. One, one I've just done already, which is to say, ha, for whom do I write if I want to make a living? This is a serious question. A producer says, for whom is this guy writing if I want to get a return on my investment? Nobody wants to lose money. Um, for whom do I write if I want to feel that I like what I write? For whom do I write if I want to look back on my life and think that I have produced works of great worth? Or you can actually investigate it internally, which is what I intend to do, and just interrogate the, the words, if you like. I mean, what do we mean by an audience? What is an audience? What is this process of writing as a, as a mechanism? We take it so for granted. One scribbles letters, one scribbles shopping lists, one scribbles away. And what is writing? What is writing as an art form? What does it do? What does it communicate? And most interestingly, perhaps, I. Who am I in this process? Well, if you want to investigate the who's, the why's, the wherefores of the written arts, I have to say that these days the bookshelves of academe are groaning with them. So you will not, you will not go hungry. But when I started off um, back in the day, as they say, they didn't exist. Most of them didn't exist. But I had these urgent questions. Serendipity had a part to play here. At that time, I was in my very early 20s, I was working for a company called the Sanskritic Festival of Arts of India run by the inimitable Birendra Shankar, the late Birendra Shankar. And what this organization did was bring um, classical musicians and dancers from India, and they performed in the UK. They performed in the South Bank Center, and then we took them on tour around, around town. And I did everything. I was the general factotum. I, I wrote the compare's notes, and I swept the stage, and I made sure they had tea, and 
bought them cigarettes and all the rest of it. And I was sitting there one day, um, there was a dancer on stage, and it was a, it was a solo Kathak performance, if, if you know, with the bells on the feet, and a small instrumental group behind was playing, and he stopped all the kind of zipping around the stage, which is incredibly spectacular and athletic, and just stood in the middle with banging his feet. Oh, I won't do it. I don't have bells for a start. And he held his palm out like that, with a little smile on his face, just kind of tapping his feet, and the musicians just played this regular rhythm. And then he went like that. And the atmosphere changed. This is Queen Elizabeth Hall. The whole atmosphere changed. And I felt a change in me, some kind of shift in my emotional fabric. And he, like that. And he went like that again. And the atmosphere changed again. And I thought, this guy has got the audience literally in the palm of his hand. And I thought to myself, how? How do you get, how, what, what's his discipline? What's his heritage? What's his tradition? So I spoke to him afterwards. And I said, is there a sort of source material that governs the artistic tradition? tradition out of which you work, and he said, well, there is something called the Natya Shastra. And then I was sort of called away to probably get somebody a cup of tea. Natya Shastra, I thought. And a couple of nights later, at the same venue, we had, a, a, it was a duet, it was just a couple of instrumentalists. It was a sarod, which was a stringed instrument, quite harsh, but very expressive. And a picard, the, the, the drums, and they were just playing away. And I was waiting for the next act, really doing my job. And I began to sort of forget all my other concerns and just get absorbed by the music. And I began to feel edgy and sort of apprehensive. And actually, it's a little tingle of almost fear. I think, what's going on? You know, who's, who's doing this to me? I'm, I'm doing my job, and just waiting to kind of shepherd people on and off the stage, and I'm feeling, is, is, it, uh, is it that I'm doubting myself? The music kind of enveloped me, and I felt, and was, seriously, I felt nervous to kind of run away and hide, but I, I did my job. And afterwards, I went to them, and, and I, I thought I'd discuss this with them, and I said, while you guys were playing, I felt this, this terrible sort of apprehension. They said, well, it's a Shiva rug. What do you expect? Shiva, this kind of scary guy. How does music, how does art, how does the formation of art actually get into you and change you and influence you in that way? And I, I put that question to him. He said, the Natya Shastra. So I got hold of the Natya Shastra, and I have a little picture of it. It came in four volumes. It cost me 80 quid. This was back, it was a long time ago. I was stony broke. I waited months for it to arrive, and I couldn't wait to get it open on the way home. Brown paper and string, and I opened it up, and there it was. And my joy at the kind of beauty, the aesthetic beauty of the day when the Gauri script was mitigated only by the fact that I couldn't understand a blinking word of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, we're going to need a bigger dictionary, as they say. Um, but oddly enough, a, a, a few months later, I, I, went to, I went to India, I was in Delhi, and I was in the tobacconist, um, waiting for the shopkeeper to finish the conversation he was having with the person in front of me in the queue. And there was a tea chest of, of books, this kind of airport literature, and I started flicking through them, and pulled out the supposedly non-existent English translation of the Natya Shastra. I oh, miracle. Well, they say that the universe is a perfect storyteller, so there, there's an instance of it. But how do you approach it? So we had, we had it in English, but even in English, I have to say, it is, it is incredibly cryptic. And it's, it's cryptic for a reason. It's because it's not just assembly instructions. And so many books on how to write, it's just, you know, add this here, screw in there, put that there, shelf up, hinge, and then you have yourself a script. It doesn't work like that. What the Nati Shasta requires you to do is to study it in depth, is to take it into your heart, is to put it into practice and then allow the words and the practice to illuminate each other. And you arrive at a different kind of meaning. You arrive at, I would say, real meaning, not just a kind of mechanistic set of procedures that you have to go through to arrive at something that looks somehow like a script. I was working with a small theatre company at the time, and we thought, well, OK, we'll do that. We will we'll take it aphoristically, we'll reflect on it. And perhaps unimaginatively, we decided that we'd start just with the first verse. I have for you. So here's the first verse. I will read it to you. I'll read it to you in Sanskrit. Pranamya, Shirasa, Dewao, Pitamaha, Maheshwarao, Natya Shastram, Pravakshyami, Brahmana, Yadudahritam. It's a lovely, lovely phrase. So we, we looked up these words and, and looked at the English dictionary. And pranam, pranam, you see, pranam is an ordinary word in, in English. This is a dedication. It's a bow. It's a bow of what? Shirasa, the second word, is the head. So it's a bow of the head. 
And what pranam means in, in India is a kind of prostration. It's, it's a humbling of oneself to whatever it is, the object of one's prostration. I went to a sitar concert recently at the, um, at the festival hall, and possibly one of the greatest sitarists of our time, and his mother and his guru's um, wife came onto the stage at the end, and he got on his knees and touched their toes. There's a complete giving up of everything. Of what? Your head. The shirasa, the head. What is this? Well, our feeling was that all our inhibitions, our doubts, our self-doubts, our, our crazy ambitions, so there we have it in English, our crazy ambitions, um, the desire that maybe this is going to make us rich or famous, or the thought that I'm not good enough, or all those considerations that we carry around and give us a sense of locality and identity and limit, you give that up. You let it go. And we thought, well, how do you do that? Obviously, you can get on your knees in front of something. Um, to Brahma and Shiva. So the idea is that you don't just cut your head off. You give your head up. You offer it to Brahma and Shiva. Now, I, although I have an Eastern background, I wasn't raised in the Hindu tradition. Neither were the other members of the theatre group, so we were a little bit at sea here. We did ask, and we were told that Brahma here represented creativity itself, and Shiva represents knowledge or form. And we thought that was really quite interesting, because what you are doing is giving yourself up to creativity itself and form. And what we thought we would do is experiment. And we would go out into the streets, the shops, we'd walk around, and we wouldn't throw ourselves at people's feet, you know, there's a lamppost, you know, because that would uh, draw the wrong kind of attention. But what we would do was, if you like, inwardly, psychologically, emotionally, we would just, we would just kind of give ourselves up to whatever was in front of us. And off we went and came back a little bit later and reported back. I've done this subsequently with a few creative writing groups, and the, the result is always the same. And people come back enlightened. And what, what they say, and I corroborate this from my own experience, is that if you give up your judgments, your prejudices, your, your idea of how something relates to you, your idea of whether you like it or not, your comparison of that to something else, all of those considerations, if you give that up, in that moment, you connect what is really there. And whether it is a lamppost, or a human being, or a dog, or a piece of litter, or a shop window, or a car number plate, what you find is that everything, first of all, is there, and that's amazing. And secondly, it tells you what it is and how it is there by the form that it takes. And what people say is when they make that connection, there is wonder, there is awe, there is, dare I say it, even love. What I find interesting is that when, when we then translated that to the writing process, we weren't just writing about the experience that we had, we were recreating that experience. So that our audience didn't just read what we felt we'd learnt from something, they learnt it themselves. The experience is transferred directly from the inspiration to the expiration to the receipt. Okay, so we went through all of that, and, and actually, that's, it's a lovely way of looking. I'll go back to Sanskrit because it's so beautiful. It's a lovely way of looking at how the arts unfold in front of us. And that's how I worked. And when I first came across the question of whether I'm writing for myself or whether I'm writing for the audience, whether I want to be content sticking with fringe theatre or whether I wanted to work in the commercial medium, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And when I understand, when I realize really, although I became convinced of it after a while, I'm now disengaging myself from it, is that this is a false dichotomy. But it's a dichotomy that actually operates through much of what we see and experience through the media. And it creates a few dangers. One danger is that it, in that vacuum, a whole industry is created that tells the writer what the audience wants. And the other danger is that because we only look at art as either a cultural bauble or as a kind of economic phenomena, it can only be justified in those terms. And that's why we see the removal of creative writing from the A-level syllabus, because it can't be justified economically. And in these times of austerity, we don't have room for cultural baubles. But what this is saying is something quite different. It's not a cultural bauble. And it's not a kind of economic phenomenon that we have to justify the arts by saying they raise tourist revenue. What the arts do is connect people to reality. And when they connect to the reality, they connect to 
Maybe it's pathos, it's tragedy, it's beauty, but they do so with love. And if you take the arts away from a human being, they decay from inside very quickly because they're isolated and they're lonely. Beware the man that hath no music in him. And if you take the arts away from society, it falls apart rapidly because where people don't connect with themselves, they don't connect with each other, there is no communication. Without communication, there is no humanity. So the arts, having become this, this idea of a commercial exploit, misses the point. They are the deepest positioning of ourselves within the context of all the people around us for all time. And what I would say to, to those who try to position you in one extreme or the other of this false dichotomy, treat them with extreme suspicion. And the next time you see artists struggling with themselves, understand what they're going through. I do want to come up with a final aphorism because people have asked me for this. And do I, for whom do I write myself the audience? My little aphoristic equation is this simply. I write for myself, but my idea of who I am includes the audience. Thank you.